hour, they're going to be views of Joel Skousen from World Affairs Brief as he brings us abreast of what's really going on in the world today. Joel, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, Dr. Stan. Well, tell us what your take is, what the important issues are, and uh, so the, uh, what is actually going on behind the scenes, not what the controlled media is telling us, but what's really transpiring. Well, constitutional conservatives were devastated today by the ruling of, uh, by the Supreme Court upholding Obamacare, the most draconian and expensive power grab since the Great Society enacted in the 1960s. Most were ta talking <coughs> about uh, Justice Kennedy being the possible swing vote that might, you know, make this in doubt. But it turned out to be just Chief Justice John Roberts that betrayed the conservative view of the Constitution. Roberts was clearly setting out to find a way to make this huge federal power grab constitutional, even though he admitted the individual mandate would not pass constitutional muster. Roberts correctly wrote, the individual mandate cannot be upheld as an exercise of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. That clause authorizes Congress to regulate interstate commerce, not to order individuals to engage in it. And yet, he found another novel way to view the mandate so that it evade, as to evade declaring it unconstitutional. Even though the Act clearly called the new tax imposed on non-participants a penalty, Roberts chose to disregard the wordage and held that the law was, an in, was a valid exercise of Congress's power to tax. Roberts reframed the debate over health care as a debate over increasing taxes. Congress, has said, is increasing taxes on those who choose not to, choose not to, go, uh, choose to go uninsured. Now, notice that he failed to observe the fact that there is no law that has ever been written before that makes something that you don't purchase taxable. Taxes only apply to things that you purchase or for government services that are being rendered. This is the first time, and he, he didn't even touch on this, the distinction that you can't tax something that isn't purchased. Roberts said the Affordable Care Act is constitutional in part and unconstitutional in part. Yet instead of finding the law unconstitutional based upon the mandate, he simply redefined the mandate as tax so he could rule it so he could rule it uh, legal. But I think it's so important to remember that uh, it was George W. Bush, a lifelong liberal in my estimation, who actually of course, appointed uh, Justice Roberts to the Supreme Court. I Suddenly I met George Bush, I shook hands with George Bush, uh, he came over to talk to me on several occasions at our meeting, and basically uh, this man lied, uh, Sydney, and I believe that's the reason he was put on the Supreme Court. He's been playing a part up until now, and I think of course that uh, this is this exactly the sort of thing that that a George W. Bush would want. I mean, George Bush gave us some of the most draconian socialist measures of all time, and now, of course, his appointee to the Supreme Court has done exactly the same thing. Well, Robert said, uh, it is reasonable to construe that Congress has done as increasing taxes on those who have a certain amount of income but who choose to go without health insurance. Such legislation is within Congress's power to tax. Absolutely abominable legal. All right, and it's not that it has nothing to do with right, has nothing to do with the Constitution. There is an agenda, ladies and gentlemen, and this, of course, the whole health care system will destroy the medical care system, system in America and bankrupt our nation. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Our guest, of course, is Joel Skousen from World Affairs Brief. And we're just talking, just saying that, uh, that the, uh, Justice Roberts was appointed by the establishment. Of course, George Bush supposedly made the uh, appointment, but George Bush was simply a figurehead for the people who were really running the country. And, of course, he put Roberts there. And there's now a the dime's worth of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. They want to give you that impression, but there isn't. Of course, the last fellow who said that was a fellow named George Wallace, and of course the assassin came to kill him. He didn't kill him, he just, uh, he just made him a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. That's what happens when you tell the truth. That's what happened to George Bush, that's what happened to Bobby Kennedy, that's what happened to Ross Perot. We'll, we'll go right ahead, Joel. Well, it's further proof that Roberts is a deeply compromised justice shilling for government. 
He said, quote, the question is not whether that is the most natural interpretation of the mandate, but only whether it is a fairly possible one. Can you imagine stating like something in the most important legal brief of the century, practically, and he states something like, it's not a matter of whether or not this is a good interpretation, but whether or not it's fairly possible to derive this. I mean, it's not even ludicrous. possible. It's not even possible. It's totally contrived by one of those people who wants to bankrupt America and destroy our health care system. Justice Roberts, of course, will have his own private insurance financed by the American taxpayers. He'll get good care. The purpose of Obamacare is to destroy our health care system and to install the death panels, and it really will do that. Go right ahead. Well, in my opinion, he won't get good care by being in the, in the health insurance industry. You'll only get establishment care, and I think people die from the use of overuse of drugs with all their side effects, at least over $200,000 a year. He deserves to be one of those someday. Well, yes, he was really stretching the law, but then again, he flat out admitted that he felt it was his duty to try to salvage anything Congress does. He said the Supreme Court precedent is that the precedent for Supreme Court is that every reasonable construction of law passed by Congress must be resorted to in order to save a statute from unconstitutionality. I mean, where did he come up with this stuff? It has never, ever been the policy openly stated that the Supreme Court was going to try to bend its uh, way to find anything constitutional. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's the duty of the court to aggressively guard against any law that even hints of unconstitutionality. But we know that Roberts is, in essence, stating what the courts have been doing for many centuries, and he's nothing different. And of course, this is part of treachery. This is part of subversion. We have subversives on the Supreme Court. And Justice Roberts is obviously one of them when he says, you know, it is possible that this might be an interpretation. Is it possible? I mean, how would you say it's possible? You, you should say it is or it's not. He only goes so far as to say it's possibly. And of course, this it means that he wants this legislation passed, knowing full well the majority of the American people don't. But there is an agenda behind this, and I believe they really want to bankrupt our country. And uh, certainly this is exactly what Justice Roberts is doing. He has been told what to do. And believe me, when you get an offer from the people who run America, you do what you're told. It's an offer you can't refuse. Go ahead. Um, well, Robert Stompathy seems to know no end. Um, Roberts had the audacity to claim that there's no real compulsion here since those who do not pay for, uh, pay the penalty for not having insurance can't be sent to jail. Really? Try not paying your taxes and you'll certainly get sent to jail. This is a new form of taking that has no limit and certainly constitutes force. Well, go right ahead, Joel. Well, Justice Anthony Kennedy took Roberts to task for writing into the law something that was never there. Quote, the fundamental problem with the court's approach to this case is this. It saves the statute Congress did not write. The court regards its strained, strained statutory interpretation as judicial modesty. It is nothing of the sort, said Kennedy. It amounts instead to vast judicial overreaching. Well, Roberts must be really proud of himself. Single-handedly, he pulled a rabbit out of the hat that no lower court had even thought of, saying that the mandate functioned as a tax and therefore isn't the mandate, a position that no lower court accepted or even promulgated. Roberts developed this novel and scurrilous interpretation on his very own. He's clearly no friend of liberty. Right. I think you ought to be impeached on that basis, uh, but I don't think anybody has the courage to do it. If they tried, they'd end up like a... Uh, like George Wallace did. Go right ahead. Well, the dissent on this was Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Robert, had Roberts not betrayed these four, Obamacare would have gone down to defeat. But this is so ironic for Roberts, the icon of conservatism, to join the, uh, uh, you know, the likes of Ginsburg and the rest. Uh, just incredible. Um, 
But we but, must never let people under, uh, forget uh, that actually uh, Roberts was appointed by George Bush, who uh, the Republicans still lionized because he was phony from the very beginning. I knew that before he was ever elected when I met him. And But he you know, basically... The media today keeps telling us how wonderful, you know, the Republicans are and how terrible the Democrats are. There's not a dime's worth of difference. They're all controlled by the same people. But we go through this whole charade every four years. We go to the polls uh, to vote the rascals out. Uh, but, of course, nothing changes. The same foreign and domestic policies persist. Oh, once in a while, a little something will come up and they throw a bone to a dog and he's grateful for it. Uh, but, of course, the meat has always been removed. Go right ahead, Joel. Well, where do we go from here? Uh, the individuals have lost totally their right to not buy insurance without monetary penalty, but states can still opt out of the increased and extensive Medicare provisions without being denied federal Medicare payments. In a major victory for the states who challenged the law, the court said that the Obama administration cannot coerce states to go along with Medicaid insurance program for low-income people. The financial pressure from the federal government puts on the states in the expansion of Medicaid is a gun to the head, said Roberts. A state that opts out of the Affordability Act and health care coverage thus stands to lose not merely a relative small percentage of its existing Medicaid funding, but all of it. Congress cannot, therefore, penalize states to choose not to participate in this new program by taking away all of their Medicaid funding. So that was the only silver lining that came out of it. Um, however, gone is the right of the states to shield individual citizens from Obamacare uh, by opting out. They can only opt out of the new increased and expensive provisions of Medicare. As for the nation, the only alternative now is to try and repeal Obamacare or repeal certain portions like the penalty tax. That's doable for the House of Representatives, by prob but probably not in the Senate. <clears throat> and even if they did it, Obama would veto it, so it would be an act of futility. Go ahead. Much will depend on whether or not Romney gets elected. Given his damaging compromise on the individual mandate in Massachusetts, it is far from certain if he will even try to repeal the mandate or its associated tax, even though he claims he will. As the LA Times noted, Romney will ride the repeal effort to its maximum effort in his election bid. The Supreme Court's decision to uphold the individual mandate central to Obama's health care law carried immediate benefits for Mitt Romney, namely a newly energized Republican electorate and the ability to keep hammering his promise to repeal the law on day one. Well, that's the easy part. He still has to get Congress to go along and they can stop any Republican president. This is the time of choice for the American people. He said, if you don't want the course of Obama's put upon us, help us defeat Obamacare. But the Supreme Court decision was also a reminder of what Romney's campaign would like the public and voters to forget that he too embraced the individual mandate uh, one that he very rarely mentions now. Now, what you're speaking of, of course, is under uh, under Romney care when he was the governor of Massachusetts, and he brought in the prototype of Obamacare. People have forgotten that he's a lifelong liberal, posting, opposing as a conservative, to give the American people the idea that we have a choice between the Socialist Party A and Socialist Party B, and the truth of the matter is, we don't. They're both controlled by the same people. They play a game. It's all a matter of perception. But in reality, when we doesn't matter whether Democrats or Republicans are there, we will still persist in our wars. We will still persist in our globalist policies. We will still persist in our program to force corporations to move their manufacturing offshore. The reason, of course, corporations move offshore is if a corporation stays in the United States, they're required to pay a 35% corporate tax uh, on their income. If they move overseas, they don't have to do that. Why doesn't anybody tell us that uh, the tax laws are written to force American corporations offshore? Because that's part of the globalist policies to send our manufacturing, our jobs, uh, certainly uh, the wealth of the American people offshore, and basically to lower living standards here in America. When you understand that, it all makes sense, outsourcing, certainly, offshoring of jobs. All of this is exactly what they want, and both political parties support it. 
but they can't let the American people know that. You're supposed to believe that every four years we can throw the rascals out. Go right ahead, Joel. Well, I think that if Romney is elected, he will fail to repeal Obamacare. It's another one of those causes so dear to the powers that be, they won't take no for an answer. That's why they got Roberts to switch sides and write this deplorable court ruling. One thing for sure, Obamacare will turn into the largest future deficit driver in history. Nothing will be solved in the health care industry. The benefit mentality of free health care will march forward inexorably, adding to the total government control scheme. And, of course, basically along with that will come the death panels, certainly every effort to uh, certainly, uh, cut off care for the elderly and they will decide who lives and who dies. This is happening in England today. It's going to happen here in America. And the only way to get away from this is to have people begin paying for their own health care. You may have to go to Mexico to get your health care. You're not going to be able to get adequate health care. They waste so much money here on treatments that they know are do far more harm than good. We'll be back in just a moment with Joel Skousen. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and certainly Joel is going to be uh, uh, certainly addressing this issue of, uh, of the uh, possibility of an economic collapse. And, of course, Joel does not feel that this is, is imminent or possible at the present time. But you pick up the story there, Joel. Well, in fact, the total collapse could never be sudden just because of the sheer size of the dollar pool internationally. Yet there's an unending flow of predictions of complete and imminent collapse coming from both the uninformed and the informed financial newsletter writers on the conservative libertarian side. Uh, and uh, let me go through some of those here. Uh, you know, the, the latter, that is, the informed newsletters, the, the Bob Chapman's and the Peter Schiff's and the others who simply should know better but haven't thought this out very well and are using the hype to generate sales of newsletters, financial products, and the need to redeem themselves from the long litany of failed collapse predictions already posted. Pastor Lindsay Williams has continued to push the bank holiday collapse scenario as coming by the end of the year. He's relying on bogus insider sources that I think are leading him astray. My friend and yours, Bob Chapman, also got fooled into believing the various scenarios supposedly touted by Christian law enforcement people claiming that the banks were going to shut down due to an imminent collapse. And that was in August of 2010. Even though that failed, Bob continued to push the collapse scenario. And there's absolutely no reason why the Fed would call a banking holiday, which would cut off all people's access to money. The economy would collapse within weeks, and they would get the blame. While they've got the means to keep creating money, there's simply no rationale for this to happen. People who continue to make these claims simply don't understand either the power of the powers that be or their plan. The list of those calling for imminent collapse is growing longer by the week, and it doesn't mean it's any more true. There's Gerald Talenti, R.J. Allen, Robert Kiyosaki, Gonzalo Lira, Michael Maloney, Mike Dillard, who's been pushing the collapse of the euro for years now and won't stop saying that despite the failure of, uh, of the euro uh, you know, to collapse. And more recently, the National Inflation Association, which is actually a, uh, a phony uh, organization, uh, Porter Stansbury and Sandra Lee. Well, economic fundamentals are crying out for a collapse. These good people either don't understand the powerful nature of the conspiracy we're dealing with and their ability to manipulate the economic numbers. Even Peter Schiff, as I said, is predicting collapse by 2014. It's reported by the Beacon Equity Research. Uh -huh. He says the United States is in a lot of trouble, which is true. After the Fed presumably embarked in QE3 and that stimulus wears off, there's going to be a crisis. I don't think we have time yet for QE4 or QE5. Well, there is no solution in the Fed monetizing the debt, whether it's QE3, 4, or 5. All it does is prolong things. But people underestimate the fact that you can continue to prolong these things. And global money he says, is looking for a safe haven, won't stand for another repeated currency debasement through monetary monetization by the central bank. But that, in fact, is absolutely not true. Not only will the global mon money establishment uh, 
stand for it. They applaud it. All of the big investors were applauding the bailout in Europe this week of, of, uh, of Spain, even those not, not directly involved, because it means the chances are better at keeping the whole system propped up. Few have any principles anymore. They simply want to be bailed out because their investments are involved, and even though they personally you know, don't like it, they still want to be bailed, want everything else to be bailed out. Now, let me review quickly here, once again, the reasons why a collapse or a devaluation of the dollar, hyperinflation, or the dollar quickly losing its reserve currency status is not only not imminent, but it can't happen quickly at any time. First of all, collapse. Collapse of a currency can only happen if it becomes relatively worthless in a short period of time. Inflation of the currency at high rates is the only thing that can cause this, ending either in devaluation or hyperinflation. Neither of these are real threats to the dollar currently, despite the huge deficit. Let's talk first then about devaluation. That happens when a currency value is pegged to another at a fixed exchange rate, and the smaller currency inflates at a more rapid rate than the pegged currency, causing an imbalance in demand, which eventually causes the peg to be broken and the new fixed rate set. But the dollar isn't pegged to anything. It's the standard, so it can't be devalued against anything. Now, in a non-peg system, such as the dollar does operate, an informal devaluation can only occur if the dollar is inflated at a much higher rate than other currencies. But that isn't happening either. Every other currency is inflating about the same as the dollar. In fact, the other currencies want U.S. inflation because it allows them to inflate their currency while maintaining the relative exchange rate, same exchange rate with the dollar. Well, we'll be back in just a moment with Joel, but Joel doesn't feel that we're going to have this uh, imminent collapse of our economic system or imminent uh, runaway inflation. We'll be right back. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Joel is giving all the reasons why Sydney, we are not going to get the massive sudden inflation. And simply, he points out that the quantity of dollars out there throughout the world being held as reserve currencies by banks, by central banks, is about 300 trillion dollars. And even if our government were to expand, uh, say, by a, a 10 percent, 30 trillion dollars a year, why we still couldn't get runaway inflation? Because the, the, the dollar is the basis of all of the currencies of the world today, for all intents and purposes. And certainly his dissertation you'll find on many of his articles on why we're not going to get an imminent financial collapse, one of them being that you have to have tremendous velocity of money moving in and out of the economy and from one person to another to really get a, a runaway type of inflation as they had in Germany or Zimbabwe. Before we go on, Joel, I want to tell our listeners how they can get a free copy of the World Affairs Brief, how they can get copies of your books, uh, the three books that you've written. Go right ahead. The World Affairs Brief comes out every Friday. There will be a new issue tomorrow. People can get a free sample copy of the brief by emailing me at editor at worldaffairsbrief.com. People can view my books on, on my other website, joelscalson.com. And um, in review, there first of all, The Secure Home. It's my largest book on uh, high-security architecture and self-sufficiency. It covers everything in high-security construction remodeling and retreating, as well as self-sufficiency generator, solar, water power, etc. My top seller is Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places. It's in the third edition, all-new color map edition with a whole new section on international retreating. Very detailed information on how to find safe places uh, and how to uh, even develop contingency plans when you can't move or seek uh, a high-security location. And the last book is How to Implement a High-Security Shelter in the Home, and that's uh, a planned book on how to develop a safe room in an existing basement. All of these books are available from Radio Liberty. And by calling 1-800-544-8927, 1-800-544-8927. Go right ahead, Joel. Well, after having said all of the reasons why I'm debunking the imminent collapse scenario uh, these I'm, I'm not saying that everything is fine. I'm not saying that 
everything's going to be fine and along in the future. I think it's a downhill slide. I think there's, in fact, going to be an inflationary mini-recovery coming in the next uh, a year or two that will start to get everyone hyped up again. It won't last because the deficit can never be paid off and uh, it's just going to get bigger with things like Obamacare in there. But if there is a real threat right now, it's the huge threat of derivatives and hedge fund bubble blowing. Trillions of dollars committed in contracts, but almost no actual asset back backing. No big paper investment happens today without credit default swap derivative type insurance or hedging. And little of that can actually be paid to the beneficiaries in a crisis if it develops because nobody has the kind of money based upon the policies, the insurance policies that they've written. I mean, there's probably $500 trillion in insurance policies that no company, none of the big banks can hope to pay that out. This mainly affects the huge speculative economy. Uh, those who have the most power to get a bailout from the fellows at the Fed, just like AIG did and uh, Goldman Sachs. But rather than see a collapse coming this year, or even by 2014, I think we're going to see another mild inflationary recovery, which is not a true recovery, but one where inflation finally starts to overpower deflationary forces and people start to spend again and higher. It won't be big, but it will help the powers to be extend this debt spiral till the end of the decade where an even bigger world conflict will help them escape the final blame. But we mustn't underestimate the powers to be and their ability to keep inflating enough to stave off default and keep inflation still below the 10% level, which is where it is hovering 8 to 9 to 10% right now. And um, in the last... Go right ahead. And in the last resort, you know, we're dealing with conspiracies here, and the powers to be could simply decide to pull the plug on the economy. All they would have to do is stop intervening in the huge derivatives market to keep those contracts from defaulting, as they've been doing recently in Europe. The derivative bubble is by far the largest Ponzi scheme ever developed. Trillions in promises to pay without any means to make good. In fact, the derivatives mess has been threatening to collapse ever since AIG in 2008, and yet the financial powers that be continue to stop derivative contracts from being collected upon. Uh, in Europe, for example, they kept insisting that no default had occurred when investors in Greek bonds had to take a 50% haircut, which means a loss, 50% loss on their bond investment. Hence, no one could make good on those CDS default swap insurance policies which are sold as guarantees on all these big, risky investments. They simply change the rules all the time and control the higher powers that might rule those Ill, uh, uh, changes illegal. I think they can keep this up for several more years, Stan. I see a downhill slide. This doesn't mean that people should, be prepare, should not be preparing for a major disaster in the world. I just don't think it's imminent nor that it's going to be a financial one in nature alone. I think war is the big thing that will drop all of the world's economies, and that's at least 10 years away. So the good news is we've got time to further prepare. All right, fine. So uh, basically then what are some of the other issues that you feel are major threats to America today? Well, let's talk about um, the serious situation. Uh, a lot of anti-war liberals and conservatives were silently cheering on Russia's moves to back the Assad regime, viewing the entire charade of regime change as a part of the globalist playbook. I alone was saying you can never trust Russia not to betray Middle Eastern allies when the fighting starts. It happened in Iraq twice, and it will happen in Iran. It just happened today or this week in Syria. Bloomberg was saying Russia has endorsed a detailed United Nations roadmap for political transition in Syria. A sign that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has lost the support of a key ally. Persuading Assad to, keep, uh, to step aside and form a transitional government to pave the way uh, uh, for, this transit, for elections will be at the core of this June 30 conference that Saturday of top diplomats organized by Kofi Annan. The foreign ministers of five permanent security council members, China, France, Russia, the U.K., and the U.S., as well as Turkey, Qatar, and Iraq, will attend the meeting in Geneva. Noticeably absent is any representation from Syria. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton yesterday called the conference a potential turning point in the conflict. It's already claimed more than 10,000 lives. They, of course, blamed all that on the Syrian regime when, in fact, 
a lot of those people were shot because the U.S. and other allies like Saudi Arabia were arming the protesters, and then the media was claiming they were unarmed when the uh, Syrian army opened fire on them. Russia has accepted the U.N. paper in full, including language that spells out Assad's departure. The Annan document, which is reviewed by Bloomberg, says a transitional government may include members of Assad's government in opposition and other groups, although not those whose continued presence, now listen to this language, the ones who can't be in the transition camera are those whose continued presence and participation would undermine the credibility of transition and jeopardize stability and reconciliation. Well, those words really constitute one-sided conditions in this paper. Russia should, could uh, never have signed on to them if she had not decided to betray Assad. According to the plan, both the regime and the opposition could veto any proposed members of the National Unity Government. Of course, that guarantees that no agreement will be reached at all. And like the no negotiations with Iran, they're not intended to succeed in these negotiations. They're destined to fail so that the international community can justify armed intervention in Syria to a larger degree than what they're already doing now covertly. The shift by Russia, Russia, which until now has shielded Assad with UN Security Council vetoes, could be the beginning of the end over this long stalemate. Uh, and so, as I say, let's explain a little bit what is Russia up to then. Two things at the same time, in my opinion. One, they keep building their reputation as the only ones to stand up against the U.S. And two, they still show that they are a player internationally. The Russians are not anxious to take on the West just yet. Everything they do is a bluff, a show of verbal force to polarize the world into West versus East. At the same time, they're anxious to continue the ploy of appearing to be the peacemakers on the international stage, a role which uh, the Anglo-American uh, Anglo uh, globalists uh, seem to be uh, fomenting and going along with. even though they know otherwise. Russia keeps failing to back up allies like Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, and Bashar Assad because they want to help the U.S. and NATO build up their reputation as the bullies of the world. This is a real slick game of cat and mouse, so very little that you hear on the news represents either side's real motives. And it's also interesting, Stan, that there was a last-minute power grab in Egypt the so-called Arab Spring has fallen apart once again. A lot of us wondered what the globalists were up to when they started all these Arab Spring rebellions against dictators that the West had supported for years. And while there certainly is a lot of conflict creation to be done by putting into power the Muslim Brotherhood, we found out today that the globalists still don't intend to give the Brotherhood any real power in Egypt. Uh, when King Farouk, uh, as he was being seen off aboard the royal yacht after being deposed in Egypt by uh, General Mohammed Najib in 1952, said, take good care of the army. The king added that uh, the army in Egypt are in good hands. Well, Egypt has remained in the good hands of the generals ever since 1952. The Egyptians in the world thought things had changed in the revolutions last year. Their hopes got a fresh boost earlier this month when uh, with the conviction of the man who was uh, the lord of all he surveilled in Egypt until this last year, Hosni Mubarak. He was not just stripped of his power, but would actually be made to come to account for his actions at the world court. Of course, he's dying, so it's kind of a hollow victory. But the celebration was clearly premature. The sweeping moves by the self-styled military council over the past few days has sparked fears in Egypt and beyond that the Arab Spring was, in fact, a sham. In a way, there have always been apprehensions of a power grab by the generals at the height of the uh, Arab Spring. The young and the restless in the Arab world, most populous nation, and the more experienced Islamists, however, kept their peace at the interest of a smooth and peaceful transition, and now they all feel betrayed. Last week, even as the Muslim Brotherhood triumphed in the parliamentary election, Mohammed Mursi won the presidential election the generals, only two days before the election, declared a, a constitutional declaration, granting themselves sweeping new powers and clipping the wings of the incoming president. For starts, the new president will have no power to con and control over the army. 
you will also have no power over legislation or the, uh, that legislation which has ceased to exist. On the other hand, the military council will have total control over all legislation, including veto power, on the new constitution and virtually all arms of the state. Two days before the presidential runoff, the military council had the parliament dissolved five months after it was elected in the first free election ever. Incidentally, the Muslim Brotherhood had swept the parliamentary, uh, parliamentary election, which was kind of like a cat among the pigeons. Uh, advisors to the military council suggest that the new president-elect, after such fanfare, could be president for only a short term as the new constitution which is being drafted under the military-controlled Supreme Judicial Council will need a new president yet again. So Egypt is clearly back to square one. The country will have at least a new democratically elected leader, but it will be little more than a puppet in the hands of the military council headed, headed by <clears throat> General Hussein Fantawi, Barbaric's longtime friend and defense minister. The generals continue to call the shots, and uh, there will be little change. If this isn't a mockery of democracy, then what is? Well, the story keeps evolving. Jason Beats noted that it's a string of rulings reinforcing the power of the military junta, an Egyptian administrative court, struck down one part of their key powers, the ruling that the military cannot uh, arrest uh, Egyptian civilians. But the practical impact is limited, however, because the military junta still controls the civilian police who do have powers to arrest people. So things don't look good on the international scene. No, I don't think they do. And Sydney, I really felt that Sydney, although I'm sure Mubarak was not uh, the greatest uh, ruler of all time, at least there was stability there. They were prosperous, and at least some of them were prosperous. And uh, But uh, I don't think that there will be any more in the way of representative government. I think all this talk about democracy in Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and Syria and Turkey and Lebanon is simply talk. And I think when the smoke finally settles, or there will be authoritarian governments of one sort or another in all of those countries operating perhaps under the facade of democracy, but there will be no true representative government. Well, there was some good news on Capitol Hill today. 255 to 67 House placed Eric Holder, Attorney General, in contempt of Congress for not complying with a congressional subpoena. Seventeen Democrats bucked the party lines and voted with Republicans to pass a criminal contempt, reso contempt resolution. House Oversight and Government Affairs Committee Chairman Darrell East has been leading the charge on this. He pushed forward these resolutions as part of a 16-month investigation into a watched Fast and Furious gun tracking operation. As I pointed out in the World Affairs Brief, the real purpose of the Fast and Furious operation, first of all, they said this was a sting operation. You're going to sell a few guns to the to the cartels, and then you're going to track where they go so that you can arrest them. Well, after 3,000-some guns, including automatic weapons, I mean, this is just a huge operation, where there wasn't a single arrest made. There wasn't even an attempt to arrest anyone. In fact, there were several Border Patrol made, uh, agents that had been killed with these guns. But the whole intent of Fast and Furious was, in fact, to blow up this major crisis of guns coming across the border and to prosecute or take away gun show rights within the United States and enact more gun control. And it blew up, of course, when whistleblowers indicated that this was, in fact, a carefully contrived operation. Well, the only reason there was such a high favorable vote on this, and I was really you know, surprised that, it, in fact, that most of the Democrats simply sat on their hands. They didn't want to vote against contempt, so they just simply didn't vote. This was a political ploy. There will be no consequences coming of it, in my opinion. It's a hollow gesture. Other than that, it may very well be brought up, Sydney, uh, during the uh, uh, during the elections. You know, uh, President Obama will be asked, "Well, why would you exert executive uh, privilege? This didn't involve you, or did you know about it? What 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 did you know, and when did you know it?" 
And that, of course, was the chant they used to get uh, uh, Richard Nixon uh, impeached. It'll be very interesting to see uh, what happens, and I do not believe it's going to die here. I believe it's going to be brought up during the, during the um, upcoming elections. Our guest, of course, has been Joel Skousen from World Affairs Brief. We'll be back in just a moment to uh, finish off the program.